All right, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Linda Bell-Neves is a researcher. She's also, uh, well, she's got a, a huge biography. Where's Linda, are you here? So, so I did have some audience questions, but because I only have 10 minutes and there's a gun involved, I'm just going to go very quickly through my slides. So just to start off with, what is Complementary Alternative Medicine, or the acronym CAM, that I'll be using throughout this presentation? It's been defined by the US NIH as a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. This is a real moving target, though, because we're starting to slowly see these therapies, if they have evidence of safety and efficacy, slowly making their way into the conventional setting. And a, a, an example would be things like acupuncture or meditation. And when we think about uh, complementary and alternative medicine, we immediately start thinking about the natural health products. And those are the ones that actually raise the most concerns in terms of potential interaction with conventional treatment. And we'll touch a little bit on that. I just want to remind you that there's a lot of other therapies out there that you can use that have less concerns around interaction. So the body-based therapies like doing yoga or tai chi or going for a massage. Mind-body, I mentioned meditation. It also might be like doing an imagery or a relaxation course. The energy therapies are things like Qigong, Reiki, or even acupuncture. And lastly, the whole systems is where we do see some people that not only access their conventional physician, but they also maybe see a naturopathic doctor or a traditional Chinese medicine doctor that provides a whole system of care. And just as a comment, up to 80% of cancer patients are using some form of CAM. So if you're a caregiver or a health professional, you can assume that your patients are using these therapies or they're thinking about using them. So let's dive right in. Before you start thinking about complementary medicine, I really think you've got to start by looking at your foundation. You need to be thinking about how your diet, your exercise, your stress management is. Obviously, tobacco use and sun exposure is of a concern. And now we're finding that sleep is becoming more and more important for overall well-being. And before you start diving into this world of CAM, perhaps spending a great deal of time, energy, and money, think about your foundation first. Because we have more evidence to suggest that these these foundations are more important than we have for the CAM therapies at present. What's your goal of using these therapies? I never make the assumption that people are using these therapies to cure their cancer. It may be part of the reason. I often find they're using it to manage side effects or symptoms of their conventional treatment, to try to promote their overall well-being, um, or they're trying to cope with the emotional impact of the illnesses. So really think clearly what your goal is in using these therapies, because it will help you in understanding the evidence around these therapies and if it will actually help you meet your needs that you have. And reflect on your previous experiences before you were diagnosed with cancer. What therapies did you use? What are your belief systems and values? It will help you in making this decision. Now, what does the evidence say? You know, there's a lot of information out in the media and social media around complementary medicine. It's not always the best source. Don't go to Google. If you're going to go to Google, go to Google Scholar, because at least then you're pulling up the evidence-based uh, papers that we know have been done in a rigorous manner and have been peer-reviewed before they've been published. When I talk about evidence, I come from a conventional perspective. I'm a registered nurse, so I focus on things like randomized clinical trials that have been done in humans with your type of cancer, not another type of cancer, because we know that cancers you know, vary greatly across different types. We also are starting to see enough research in complementary medicine that we have things called systematic reviews and meta-analyses where they combine a whole bunch of therapies or a whole bunch of studies together and can come to some conclusion about whether these therapies can be helpful or not. While we know that test tube and mice models is important foundational research, what happens in a mouse does not mean it's going to happen in a human being. So we really have to wait for those clinical trials before we can make any type of clinical recommendation around safety and efficacy. Now, there is more and more credible sources of information around complementary medicine. So I mentioned Google Scholar. I would suggest also going to some of the national and international centers that have been developed that focus on this area of complementary medicine. So the, the one in the United States is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. It's through the NIH. And the NCI in the United States, their Cancer Institute, also has an Office of Cancer and Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And if you're trying to quickly write down these or take pictures of them, we have links to all of these websites um, through my research program called Cameo. So if you can write down cameoprogram.org, we have links to all of these resources plus some additional ones that we don't have time to talk about today. 
There's also some other ones that I don't have time to go through, but I always uh, go to Memorial Sloan Kettering if I'm looking at natural health products or to natural medicines to see what the latest evidence is around natural health products. Memorial Sloan Kettering has an app called About Herbs that you can download on your phone if you want to look up evidence-based information. I always say too, if you're using complementary medicine, think about the side effects. And it's not just for therapies that you're using for your cancer, it could be for other health conditions that you're living with. There's a whole host of side effects that natural health products can have. They can thin your blood, they can cause organ, uh, organ uh, disability, they also can affect how drugs are broken down in your body. They can keep drugs too much or they can let them go too quickly. And if you're undergoing conventional treatment, you really don't want to take anything that's going to be negative affecting uh, your therapy. The other thing too is it's not just natural health products. With body-based therapies, if you're doing an exercise program, you have to think about whether you have the energy to actually undertake that intervention. And if you're doing something like massage or any kind of a manipulation therapy, you have to think about whether your bones are healthy enough to hold that or if you could have bruising because you have uh, changes in your blood and you may have blues, uh, bruising and bleeding because of that. Acupuncture is fairly safe, except there is bruising and bleeding issues that are of concern. Most mind-body therapies are very safe, except for hypnosis, which can cause dizziness uh, for some individuals um, if they're not brought out of a trance appropriately. When's the right time to use CAM? We usually err on the side of caution, of do no harm, and because we really lack clear evidence around the interaction of many of the natural health products with conventional medicine, we often suggest people wait until they're moving into the survivorship period to really start using a lot of natural health products, because we don't know if it could negatively affect how your chemotherapy or other medications are working. Um, if you experience a reoccurrence, we often see individuals will uh, start pursuing more complementary medicines at that time and it may change how you have a conversation with your physician or other practitioners about your use of CAM if you do experience a reoccurrence. If you're undergoing active treatment, you may want to use things that are less invasive like a body-based therapy or a mindfulness therapy to help support you during that journey. Uh, but the key is really think about potential interactions as well as think about your energy level in committing to new therapies. You have to think about your overall quality of life. We've talked a lot about some of the physical things you need to be thinking about, but think about your emotional well-being when you're committing to a new therapy. Does it give you a sense of control? Does it help you address some beliefs and values that might be really important to you? That can be a reason for using these therapies. But you have to balance it against the potential cost, not just physical. Many of these therapies can be very expensive. Can you financially afford to use these therapies? How much time and energy do you have to commit to these therapies? And could using them negatively affect some of the relationships around you? And I've seen families become very uh, disrupted because of the use of complementary medicine. Who should you talk to? Only 60% of cancer patients share their use of complementary medicine. And this is actually where I've based my research program because we really need to be disclosing everything we're using to provide safe and comprehensive care to you as a patient. So I really encourage you to share your CAM use and your interest with your oncologist or surgeons, family physicians or nurse practitioners, as well as the rest of the allied healthcare team. Obviously, if you're seeing a CAM provider, you'll want to also talk to them about what conventional treatments you're receiving and any new test results so that they're able to provide appropriate care. And if you're lucky, you hopefully will have a team that will be willing to work together or at least exchange some information. How do you select a CAM provider? This can be a tough one. I usually say you need to go in like you would go in if you're uh, getting your car repaired. You need to be asking people, what type of training do you have? Do you work with people with my type of cancer? Are you provincially regulated or are you a member of a professional association? This varies across the country. What kind of claims are they making and what evidence support those claims? If they're saying they're gonna cure your cancer, I usually have a little bit of a warning sign go off. Is there a conflict of interest? Are they recommending therapies, particularly natural health products, that they're charging you for and making a profit off of? And what co coverage do you have through third-party insurance? And again, can you afford to do this? And the big thing for me is, are they willing to work with your other health professionals, even if it's just putting a summary of your treatments together? 
And here's just some warning signs for me. If they're incredibly expensive and you're thinking about putting a second mortgage on the home, I get a little concerned. If they're saying, I can cure your cancer, you should stop all your other medications because my therapies won't work without it, I get very concerned. And if they have no treatment plan whatsoever, I think they should have a treatment plan like any other health professional. You should keep a CAM diary and keep track of any negative side effects and blood tests associated with it, and don't use too many new therapies at one time, and revisit your CAM decisions. Things will change as you move through your cancer journey. The evidence is changing very rapidly in this field too, so you should always going back to the research, and try to keep a healthy balance on whatever choices you make around your treatment. Thank you. Wow. Quick.